In the sky, at any one moment, there are about 500,000 people. But when I think about that air travel, I imagine big commercial airlines, vast quantities of fossil fuels being burnt, and the worst food in existence. But at least you might get a nice holiday. But increasingly, we're hearing more and more about eVTOL, or electric vertical takeoff and landing, which promises to make flight a much more normal and everyday occurrence in our travel across different cities. It all sounds very futuristic, but here in Vancouver, flying in small planes across the city in planes that carry 3 to 19 passengers is already a very normal occurrence and has been since 1982. Today, Harbour are on a mission to electrify their fleet of 40 planes, and I'm here to meet the team who are doing it. And this is the Fully Charged Show. Looking for some sunshine and clean air? Well, where better than Southern California this September? We're bringing all of the electric vehicles under the sun and an array of clean technologies to America's finest city this fall. Yes, that's right. Fully Charged Live USA, powered by Electrify America, is coming to San Diego. So for fresh perspectives, exhilarating test rides, electrifying live talks, and all of your favorite YouTubers, Get your tickets today. We're commuting people and goods between uh, coastal communities here that are 20 to 30 minutes flight. You only need to bring on board the energy necessary to get you between here and there. You would think from a purely logistics perspective that electrifying flights should be a reasonably straightforward challenge. We've got batteries, we've not got that many planes, and we've got airports ready and waiting for charging infrastructure. Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple, and it's for a number of reasons, but the biggest one is gravity. Getting something off the ground requires a lot of power. Just think about how much easier it is to do a roly-poly on the ground versus a somersault in the air. And so planes need to store as much energy as they possibly can in the smallest space and the smallest weight possible. Now that's something called the specific energy, or watt-hours per kilo. And today, jet fuel has about 40 times the amount of specific energy than lithium-ion batteries that we have available. And that ends up being about 14 times the amount of usable power. So of course, if we electrify planes with today's technology, they are going to come with a range penalty. Fortunately though, planes like the ones that Harbour Air uses don't need to be doing hundreds of kilometres in each stretch, more like tens of kilometres, 50 or 60 kilometres. And that means there's a whole host of planes ready and waiting to be electrified using today's technology. And in 2019, that's exactly what Harbour Air set out to do in partnership with MagniX and H55, starting with their six-seater, 62-year-old DHC2 Beaver. It's, a, it's an iconic Canadian aircraft and we're doing a Canadian product and we really wanted to highlight that. But also it was the most practical aircraft out of our fleet. Where electric uh, aviation is right now, it's really only the smaller aircraft is it practical for. It's, it's going to grow into the bigger ones, but the smaller aircraft is, is definitely where it's more applicable. Uh, if you look at the Harbour Air routes, the ones that the Beavers do, they're in the 20 to 30 minutes kind of range and that is something that we can target with this particular aircraft and so that was why this one was was chosen. Some of these aircraft were used to deliver people and medical supplies and food to, to northern communities where nothing else could get up there, right? That's that's what they were intended for. Yeah. Um, so yes, they're, they're a workhorse aircraft. They were never really a, a commuter aircraft originally. So we took a de Havilland Mark I Beaver and took the piston R985 Wasp Jr. off and put on a Magni X electric motor. It's around 150 kilowatts. We were able to work with um, a battery supplier that did a, uh, used a NASA designed battery to make a very super safe lithium ion battery to power this thing for, we've been going so far 20, 30 minute flights with a 20 minute reserve. 
Was there any skepticism about whether they should be electrified? Absolutely. You get that with any classic vehicle of, of any kind. You've got the people who, who feel that uh, you should never touch it. It should be stay the way it was. Uh, even uh, going back so far, if they have photos from it from when it was first came off the assembly line, whatever color scheme it had when it first came off, how it was marked, you want to return it to, to that because that's that it's it's a sacred thing to many people. Yeah. But I think for, for us, though, it's an icon of, of Canadian history. And we really felt that, uh, you know, you don't have to do all of them. There will still be some behind that can, can remain pristine and perfect in their original in their original form. But I think for 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 this particular project, being able to take such a, an iconic Canadian aircraft and use it, it was a pioneer, right? Yeah. And it's going to be a it gets to be a pioneer again. And that that we really liked. No matter who the skeptics are, for an electric conversion, the Beaver and its unique design was an obvious choice for many reasons. The style of the Beaver was all the fuel was kept in the belly. That was that was the design of it. Um, it's a semi-monocoque structure. The wing, the way it's structured, you can't really uh, put the, the fuel in the wing so easily. We did have to expand a little bit beyond that because uh, on this first prototype, um, the battery modules were not as efficiently shaped as, as as necessary for a retrofit. A lot of the battery manufacturers out there look at everything as like just a big solid pack and it, it doesn't lend itself to dispersion throughout the aircraft. So um, this particular prototype, we used up some of the other space, uh, but in the future as we move forward, the modular batteries will, will fill those types of, of areas. So if you look at it like a, like a Lego thing and you can stack them all under the floor or up front or in the cargo area, because you also have to really be cognizant of keeping the center of gravity of the aircraft the same. So on a retrofit, you, you can't decide where that's going to be. It's already defined for you. So you have to fit the batteries around that. And if they're not shaped adequately to support that, you're going to end up out of your C of G, even if you're within the acceptable weight. With uh, piston engines and turbine, um, the, all these engines, in order to make the horsepower, they generally have to get the propeller up to a certain RPM. The piston engine won't make its rated horsepower at a low RPM. It needs to get to that sweet spot. Electric motors can make the horsepower at pretty much any RPM you want. So now for propeller designers, they're going to be able to change, almost throw the rule book out and try and make propellers that can develop a lot of thrust at low RPM, a lot of thrust at high RPM. You're still going to have to worry about the propeller tips breaking the sound barrier, but you'll be able to really play with the propeller design to get an efficient amount of thrust at whatever RPM works well for a design. So the, the electric motor is definitely more efficient than burning fuel. I mean, when you're generally burning fuel, you're generating a lot of heat, then you've got to get rid of that heat. And that heat is just wasted energy, whether it's a turbine or a piston. Um, the electric is definitely way more efficient at turning energy into thrust. One of the, I guess, the challenges right now is storing the energy in an efficient manner, trying to get as close to a fuel, that density of energy per pound or per cubic space is very difficult right now with batteries. It's nowhere near what it is with fuel. There have been a ton of battery innovations and improvements over the past decade. But the challenges that Harbour Air have faced in electrifying this aircraft show that we still need a few more. Innovations that mean we can have smaller batteries or batteries that are lighter or batteries that can withstand a higher number of fast charging cycles. And luckily we have a load of companies pioneering new solutions to develop new battery chemistries that can help the uh, aviation industry electrify across an even bigger range of aircraft very excited in what's coming. Um, it's a lot like the beginning of the turbines. When the turbines first came out, either as pure jets and then eventually to fans and turboprops, the pure jets that came out, they burned a lot of fuel, made a lot of noise. Times between the engines getting taken out and rebuilt and put back in were very short. The engines weren't very reliable. Nothing like the piston engines at the time. But as they got going and progressed along, now look at where the turbo fans and turbo engine, turbo prop engines and turbo jet engines are now. That's pretty much um, the, the norm for jet travel is it's going to have a great big jet engine on it. We're in the same boat. We've started, we've got an electric motor, we've got it on an airplane and it's flying. As the batteries get better, it gets better. As the motors get better, 
it gets better. It's just nothing but better, better, better as everything progresses along. We can't wait, it's gonna be great. This was something that was really near and dear to our hearts. Uh, and this particular prototype that we're looking at right now, um, it's, it's, it's not going to be commercial the way it is, but it taught us that we were, we were there. Mm -hmm. And in our next design iteration that we're, we're working on, uh, we fully expect that that aircraft, once it's certified, will be in service for decades to come. So it really feels as if electric flight might not be that far away. And in fact, the first electric flight was in 1884, traveling a staggering eight kilometers. Now at the time, the creator Charles Reynard said that it was just a matter of time and money before electric flight would really mature. And he wasn't wrong. 138 years and billion dollars later, and it feels like we're on the precipice of this third era of aviation, this electric era of aviation. But what is so cool about this third era of aviation is that on the one hand, you have the sci-fi flying car e veto aspirations, and on the other, you have companies like Harbour Air already showing us the value of electrifying small and short flights and doing it with planes that would otherwise have to be retired. Making things more efficient and making them live longer, that's what sustainability is all about. If you've liked what you've seen today, then please do like, share and comment or even support us on Patreon. We will be following this space super closely, so if you have any questions about electric flight, then please do let us know in the comments. And as ever, if you have been, thanks for watching. Well, I hope you really enjoyed that episode. If you want to see how long we've been doing this and how much we've improved, have a look at that episode. That is a classic from the early days. That is our latest episode. Fantastic. Up here, you can subscribe to Fully Charged, and there is our Patreon supporters page. Have a look.